Mr. Preston, take it away. Hey, everybody. Um, so in case you don't already know, I'm Chris. And I am a second year graduate student in nuclear engineering. So I work on more civilian nuclear power. So uh, I'll be giving a lecture today introducing you all to nuclear reactors. It's actually going to cover a variety of topics um, in relative little depth. Uh, but the nice thing is that there's plenty of experts in this room. So I've got a whole lot of people to help me answer any questions you might have. Um, I'm going to go pretty quickly, but don't hesitate to stop me if you have any questions. Uh, take notes, but I'm not sure that you're really going to need to remember how all of this stuff works. Uh, the important concepts are seeing how this relates to your policy and your, your uh, group project. So let's start out. Um, we've been talking about nuclear weapons, but this is a nuclear power plant. Um, and actually, the nuclear part of it, the reactor, is right there. So uh, that's mostly what we're concerned about. Here's the turbine. So in any power plant, basically what we have is the turbine, and well, we'll draw like the picture, and the generator. And what we're trying to do is get the turbine to spin, which spins this shaft, and we get electricity out of the generator. Um, and so really what all power plants do is they figure out a way to get this to turn. And mostly the easy way to do this, or not necessarily the easy way, but the way that we do it is with steam, that's steam, uh, or potentially gas. So not necessarily water boiling, but it could be a gas extending in this turbine. And that's how a coal power plant works. That's how a natural gas power plant works. That's how a nuclear power plant works. The question is, uh, <clears throat> what are you using to get that steam in the first place? Um, but the turbine is really an essential part. Uh, right. So this is a nuclear core. Uh, did everyone copy down this information? Can I erase it? Well, I guess we can leave this here. The bow tie. Um, so in a nuclear core, we have fuel rods. This is a light water reactor. This is what is in commercial operation in the United States. Um, we have. <clears throat> They're in this, this liquid, the coolant. So basically what's happening is you're having heat generated in here, and you're taking it out through flow in the coolant, which is running past the hot fuel rods, and potentially boiling and turning the turbine with steam. Or there's another option, but I'll explain that a little bit later. Um, in light water reactors, the stuff in here, the coolant, you're not only cooling down the fuel, but you're also helping the nuclear reactions happen. Uh, if you remember from the previous lecture, you need to slow down the neutrons in the reaction in order to get them to cause fission to happen. And so what that means is that your coolant is also acting as moderator. So I'll just quickly go through and label these things. Um, it's not that you necessarily have to reproduce this beautiful schematic, more just that you need to know generally how it all works. And then there's some other things in here, like uh, the reactor has shielding, which is so the neutrons that are being produced in these reactions are not coming outside of the reactor. Um, you also have things like reflectors, which means that they're making sure that not only do neutrons not get out, but that they come back in so that you use as many of them as possible. The other thing that you may have heard about are control rods. And so these are absorbing material. Um, and what they do is, rather than letting neutrons bounce off of them, they keep them so that they can't ca keep causing reactions. So if you ever need to slow down the rate at which you're producing energy, you can insert your control rods in order to stop the reactions from happening as quickly. So that's, that's basically, now you know how nuclear reactors work. Um, 
And then let's get a little, this is the most technical slide in the presentation. So K infinity or the multiplication factor, you can just think of it as a variable. Uh, what it essentially says is I have X neutrons coming into this lifetime and I have Y neutrons coming out on the other side. When you have K infinity equal to one in this idealized system, you have a critical reactor. What that means is what you put in, you get out. So now when we go to our next generation, we have Y equals X. And on the other side, if it's still critical, we keep, well, that's not infinity. We keep getting Y back out. So it's self-sustaining. That's what a critical reactor is. So if you ever see a movie or something or a video game or whatever, so it's like, oh, the reactor's gone critical. That's the good thing. That's what we design it for. Um, if K is less than one, so it's over here. So K equals one is critical. K less than one is subcritical. What that means is the reaction will slow down and eventually die out. K greater than one is supercritical. In a nuclear reactor, nuclear power plant, you're basically controlling to keep K equal to one. And there are some other factors in a non-ideal reactor, but we don't need to talk about those. Um, in a nuclear weapon, you want K greater than one because you want it to uh, grow exponentially until you exhaust all the nuclear material. And you generate a lot of heat, but it happens very quickly. So there are a couple factors um, that are in this equation, and it's not so important for you to understand them mathematically as it is for you to understand conceptually what's happening in uh, a nuclear reactor. So the first thing we have is the reproduction factor. And the reproduction factor essentially tells you, um, all right, I'm gonna, is it okay if I erase this right here? Okay. And trust me, after this presentation's got a lot more pictures and few variables. Um, <clears throat> eta, or the neutron reproduction factor, essentially tells you uh, when we have that neutron come in and we have our, our uranium nucleus, for example, that we've talked about and how fission works, uh, and then we get this excited nucleus where I'm using this to say that it's the, this is the original uranium plus the neutron. Um, the neutron reproduction factor tells you for every neutron that is absorbed in the fuel, this is how many you can anticipate to get out. And so if you remember from lectures, we said that this breaks up into a couple pieces and a few neutrons. Remember that when we talked about how many on average you get out of a reaction? So the neutron reproduction factor is going to be on the order of two or three. Um, so keep in mind, we're trying to somehow have these four things multiplied together equal one. Uh, the next thing is the thermal utilization factor. The thermal utilization factor tells you for all of the neutrons that are not just absorbed in the fuel, but are lost in the coolant or lost in the shielding, um, this is how many are actually used for fission. So you can expect this factor to be less than one because inevitably you're going to lose some neutrons in various other places. For example, the control rods. Uh, the next thing is the resonance escape probability. Now, this is probably the most technical one. Um, but really what's happening here is, uh, I don't know if all of you remember from the last lecture, but there was this, this graph that kind of looked like this. And what it was telling you is sort of the probability that fission will happen based on how fast the neutron is going. Um, and so this area right here is called resonance. And all you really need to know is, as a neutron is slowing down, it has a probability that it gets captured before it gets to the part where it's going to actually cause fission. So the resonance escape probability is the probability that a neutron will slow down without getting captured in a way that it won't produce fission. 
Um, and then finally, the fast fission factor is a factor that tells you the total number of fission neutrons. So the total number of neutrons you get out of fission compared to the number of fission neutrons you get from specifically those neutrons that slowed down. And okay, I think I'm gonna take a step back real quick and just kind of summarize. Essentially what we have is K, which we want to equal to one, is equal to the number of neutrons we get out of a reaction times how many of them are actually gonna cause fission times how many of them are actually gonna get to the point where they can cause fission times extra bonus. And the bonus is fast fission. And so what that means is we've talked about how things need to slow down to cause fission, um, but sometimes they don't have to. Sometimes they cause fission when they're really fast and the probability is low, but it's still a probability. And so essentially that last factor is sort of a correction for all of the times something crazy happens, something improbable. Um, these fast fissions are much less probable, but they do happen. And there's actually reactors that we'll talk about later that totally depend on those fast fissions happening, those less probable fissions. Um, if this is a little out there for you, don't worry about it. Uh, it's just important that you've been exposed to this information and it'll sort of make a little bit more sense is if you think about how the reactor works and we talk about all the other things that are going on in nuclear reactors besides just keeping it critical. But I think probably the most important thing is right here. Yes. So the thermal utilization and resonance escape probability are both always less than one and fast <laughs> is always greater than one? Correct. Because fast fission is the total number of fissions versus the fissions that we're talking about just from neutrons slowing down enough. <clears throat> so you got two and a half basically for the first one two factors that are less than one, and then another factor that's greater than one. And somehow the product of all of those, we want to balance out to about one. <clears throat> so this is what nuclear reactor fuel looks like. Um, there's a whole lot of different types of nuclear reactor fuel, but the most important one to talk about is uranium. So generally, uh, nuclear fuel is some amount of uranium. and um, is it okay if I erase things? Uh, does anyone need to? Okay. This kind of looks like incoherent scribbling anyway. So I'll leave it after there. But nuclear fuel is mostly uranium 238, which is uh, the most abundant natural isotope of uranium. However, there's a small amount of uranium 235. And uranium 235 is the isotope that fissions easily. So in general, if you looked at the course notes, there's about 0.7% of all natural uranium is this one, the one that fissions easily. And everything else is mostly this, mostly uranium-238. So in a light water reactor, which are the ones that are mostly in commercial operation, uh, we enrich the natural uranium to have a higher uranium-235 content, around 3 to 5%. And we talked about significant quantities. I think so. So you need enrichment far upwards of this for a nuclear weapon. Um, but the problem in proliferation comes from the ability to keep uh, putting together bits of this small amount of enrichment until you can make a, a mixture of something that has a lot of this. Uh, so it's just something to think about. There's all different types of fuel. And every time somebody wants to design a new type of fuel, we have to wonder, you know, how easy is it to get nuclear weapons material out of this? So in case anyone's wondering, I don't know if you've ever heard about it, but uh, nuclear reactors have something on the other side after they produce the power. So this is what nuclear waste looks like when it's stored. Um, I guess I just wanted to make sure that I sort of explain it. So nuclear uh, spent fuel, we call it, is essentially those pellets that I showed on the previous slide, except they're not really that good for producing energy anymore. Um, that's not to say that they couldn't be used for anything ever again. It just means that right now they're not what we use to power our reactors. 
Um, there are different things you can do with spent fuel. So spent fuel is essentially uh, from the fission reaction. It's these things, except they're not being useful as fission material anymore. Um, so you can imagine, I mean, these are just atoms with different numbers of nucleons. So we could probably do something with them to, to get energy out of them again. Uh, and there's something called reprocessing, which is where we basically blend nuclear fuel together with, with some new material in order to make something that's useful as nuclear fuel once more. Um, reprocessing has its own proliferation concerns because, I mean, you're essentially enriching material. So what else could you be doing with that facility pertaining to nuclear weapons? Um, so that's just something to think about. Uh, like I said, this presentation has a lot of different concepts in it, so I'm not, I can't go too much into depth of every single concept. But uh, so that reactor is is right here. That's this. So even in that picture where I showed you where the reactor building is, it's even much much smaller than that. And the reason is for protection. So there's this big containment uh, nowadays. If you design a nuclear reactor, it has to be able to withstand a jet flying directly into it. Uh, has to be able to withstand all sorts of earthquakes and everything like that. Um, so that's where it's located. So when you see that nuclear plant that I showed in the first slide, you know that's just that one building. So this is really how it all works, how it all fits together. Um, but I talked about the core. But what are those things? So. This is one type of nuclear reactor. And I, I don't expect you to understand this diagram or be able to reproduce it or anything like that. But really, the main thing that I want to tell you here is we talked about producing steam to turn this turbine. And what we're doing is, in a pressurized water reactor, we're actually making sure that we don't get steam from our in, this, in the core. So we just have a highly pressurized water that is never allowed to turn to steam. And we have a secondary loop that has water that can turn to steam. And what that mainly does is it separates your water that has contact with the nuclear material from your water that doesn't. Uh, and so you just have a closed loop system with the water that's getting heated by the nuclear material. Um, so that's one of the main types of nuclear reactors that's commercially operational in the world. The other one is a boiling water reactor, which is where we let this, the water turn to steam in the primary loop. And that's, that's really the main difference. If you see those pressurizers, those things attached to the core, then you know it's a pressurized water reactor. If they're not there, it's a boiling water reactor. So that's just the, the two side by side so you can see the difference. Um, however, one, one reactor of particular interest, especially for this class, is a heavy water reactor. So in, in a light water reactor, it's, this is why it's called light water versus heavy water. In a light water reactor, light water is H2O. It's water that you know and love. Uh, heavy reactor or heavy water reactor is um, D2O or deuterium uh, with oxygen. And so what this is is it's an isotope of hydrogen that has uh, two ne two neutrons and one proton. Where am I with this? I'm sorry, it has one neutron. Um, and so the reason that water is such a good moderator is because it's almost the same mass as neutrons. And so like Professor Van Biver talked about with the billiard balls, it's really good at slowing down those neutrons because they are two things about the same size and they collide into each other. Um, so that's why we like to use like light water as your moderator, the thing to slow down the neutrons as they're bouncing around a bit. Uh, the thing is, though, that these, the, the water, or uh, the hydrogen atoms in water tend to take these neutrons that are coming in and attach them. And so you, you have a little bit of a penalty to efficiency because of absorption in the coolant that I talked about earlier. So this is the reason why we have to enrich fuel to 3 to 5% in the first place. Because at the natural enrichment of 0.7% uranium 235, the reactions simply don't happen efficiently enough to keep them sustained, to have this K equal one. However, there's a reactor design called that pressurized heavy water reactor that uses deuterium. And in deuterium, you get a little bit less uh, of moderation, 
but you also don't absorb these neutrons as they're bouncing around because you already have a neutron attached to your hydrogen atoms. And so what this means is you're actually able to run a reactor with natural uranium. So this is really important for proliferation concerns because what it means is a country can operate a heavy water reactor and they don't need an enrichment facility. So there's a couple different ways you can look at this. If a country says we just want peaceful nuclear power, but they have enrichment facilities and heavy water reactors, then what are they enriching for? Uh, another thing is that heavy water reactors tend to produce more plutonium 239, 239, 238, tell me that. 239. 239. From this uranium 238, which is weapon can be used in weapons uh, as weapons grade material. Um, in fact, there's a specific design of heavy water reactor called the CANDU reactor, which is Canadian, it stands for Canadian Deuterium Uranium Reactor, where it has these, what are called calandria. So instead of having that pressure vessel, it has these pressure tubes. And in a normal light water reactor, you have to shut down the reactor for a certain amount of time in order to replace the fuel, to put in fresh fuel. However, in a CANDU reactor, they're designed so that they never have to turn off. You can just refuel online by taking out one tube and putting in another. Now, if you think about that, it makes it a lot harder to monitor whether people are accounting for all the nuclear material that they get out of their reactor um, because they don't have this big scheduled outage where you have a lot of different activity that you can notice with trucks coming in, personnel, extra personnel for the fuel switch. So heavy water reactors, um, are seen as potentially signifying or making it easier to, to proliferate nuclear weapons material. Um, okay, I don't know if the rest, well, I have a lot more stuff, but if it's beyond what you want me to talk about, just let me know. Uh, I guess before we go on, if anyone has any questions about anything I've said so far, please let, you know, please let me know, because I think this is probably the most important part of the presentation, what I've covered already. Um, moving on, I'll talk about some things that I find interesting and that I think may be interesting to all of you, but uh, I wanna make sure that these other concepts were relatively clear. A couple of questions about that. So in a, since I'm not a reactor, um, in a, uh, Boiling water reactor, there's no secondary loop then, so the steam, which may contain, uh, almost maybe sure, surely will contain some uh, radioactive isotopes, actually, is, will be in contact with the turbine. Correct. Okay. Second question. Um, in the four function formula there, one loss mechanism. For the neutrons, is that can actually, which I didn't talk about, but we'll maybe talk about sometime in the future, can actually be captured by the uranium and gamma decay to the ground state without fissioning. That goes into uh, that goes into the thermal utilization factor. Then is that buried in there? Yes. So okay. so the thermal utilization factor is once the neutron is absorbed, does it actually produce a fission? Does anyone else have any other questions? I was actually going to connect. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up because I was actually going to connect to the nuclear reactions you talked about last last lecture. Um, so, if you all, if you don't remember, there was uh, a slide on the last presentation in which um, there was the total cross section. So the total what works out to be used in the probability of interaction between the neutron and say the uranium nucleus. And it was composed of a, a few different probabilities, a few different cross sections. Um, there was elastic scattering, there was inelastic scattering, there was neutron capture, and there was fission. So whether you're a control rod or you're some water or you're shielding, any of these things, well, could potentially happen to you or probably won't depending on what you are. Um, but let's say you're uranium atom because there are definitely any of these things could happen to you. So the neutron could come in and it could bounce right off of you. 
and that's elastic scattering. Um, although elastic scattering is distinguished from inelastic scattering in that it's a perfect collision and scatter, which means that you're not changing the energy. It's not the neutron is imparting energy to the thing it bounces off of. Inelastic scattering can happen when the neutron actually changes energy. And so inelastic scattering is the primary thing that happens in the, in the cool, in the moderator, which is what I'm talking about here. And so that means that some of the energy from the neutron that's going fast is, is taken away from it so that it slows down. Elastic scattering is more a reaction that you'll see in the reflector so that you can make sure that the neutrons don't leave, but they stay inside. It's waiting until something happens. Uh, neutron capture is something that happens primarily in the absorber, um, but also can happen in the fuel as well. And what that means is that it gets in there and it doesn't come back out. And rather than fission or something else, whatever absorbs that neutron de-excites simply by the emission of a gamma ray. So energy. And then finally, of course, one that we are most interested in is fission. And that's when the neutron is absorbed and that causes the atom where it's absorbed to fission. Any questions on that? Which is the one where it de-excites by the gamma ray? So that's called neutron capture. And what that means is it, it gets absorbed, and, it get, and what has absorbed it now has excess energy. But rather than doing something like splitting apart to relieve that energy, it simply emits a gamma ray. It doesn't emit a particle, per se. It emits energy. Which, sorry. Oh, yeah. What is, like, what is this formula all about? Oh, so this, so this is the, the total cross-section, or sort of like the total probability of an interaction. So, I mean, there is a possibility that the neutron flies through something without really interacting with it. So it essentially doesn't see it. That was the idea of the cross-section, is that it's like, its physical size to that object is finite. So this total probability of interaction is composed of some probability that it will bounce off some probability that it will run into it, lose a little bit of energy, but still bounce off. Some probability that it will get stuck to it. And some probability that it will cause fission. Probably that's about gamma. Yeah. 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 The absorption of fuel, like uranium, without actual fission, that's contained in the reproduction pack, not the realization. It's absorbed by the realization splits out of the fuel absorbed by the fuel rather than anything else. The reproduction factor weighs the average neutrons per emission by the total cross sections to take into account the amount of additional energy. So it's just. Thank you. Did everyone understand what he just said? So, so what he said was that. Um, the absorption of the neutron releases gamma as part of eta and not the pack, right? So, okay. Um, right, right. The thermal utilization factor is about whether the neutrons are actually going to the fuel or whether they're going somewhere else. The reproduction factor is once the neutrons are absorbed in the fuel, do they cause fission? And therefore, how many come back out? So thank you. Any other questions? So what do we want um, this total probability to be around? Is there a certain ballpark? Uh, really I think, OK, so this is maybe if someone wants to correct me on this, um, I'd appreciate it if I'm wrong, uh, or if you can say it better. but. I believe that it is not, there's no universal total cross section that every atom has. It's because, I mean, some just have a lower likelihood to have an interaction at all. So the total cross section, in, in the way that we think about cross sections, like how big is the barn that you're trying to hit? Um, some barns are small and some barns are big. Anything else? 
All right. So I think I'll go through stuff quickly now because this other stuff is not necessarily something you all should leave this class knowing forever, but um, it's important to know in the context of this course that there are a whole lot of uses for nuclear energy that make it very probable to, that we'll see more of it in more countries all over the world. And there are people that, well, there are people that say if a country gets nuclear energy, then they're more likely to get nuclear weapons or be able to get nuclear weapons if they want to. And so it's important to realize that there are a lot of reasons why people want to have nuclear scientists and nuclear power plants without producing weapons. However, you have to balance the everyone could have it, the benefit of the doubt with different ways that you can mask clandestine weapons activity. So um, the plants that I've talked about are what exists already. Um, this is basically just a really small nuclear plant. It's called a small modular reactor. And uh, this is basically the next, the next new thing that we're going to see, uh, hopefully in the United States, but also in other places in the world are interested in small modular reactors. Small modular reactors, basically they're smaller. Um, which means that they may be useful for deployment in remote locations, military operations in uh, other places, Arctic research bases, et cetera. So this is something that could potentially be an individual power source for, say, a clandestine facility. So small modular reactors are good for civilian power, but who knows how they could be used. Um, this is a slight variation on a figure that many nuclear engineers have seen a lot of. Uh, but basically, it just shows the timeline. We Nuclear reactors are not just one thing. There's a whole lot of different ones. And uh, people have been working on them throughout history since they've been invented. Um, so there are more designs coming out. Uh, however, every time somebody wants to build a new type of nuclear reactor, um, if it uses any different technology than the one that everybody already understands, you have to bring into account all of the different ways. It might be different in terms of regulation, the way that the International Atomic Energy Agency can make sure that you're not trying to produce weapons material. There's all sorts of complications that arise. Um, so yeah, I'm not gonna go through and explain all of these in too much detail, but the point is that in these new types of reactors, there's a vision for being able to do a lot more than just produce electricity. So there's reactors that operate at much higher temperatures than any other power plant, which means you can use them for things like, um, I'm just gonna go past this, hydrogen production, uh, decarbonizing lots and lots of different parts of your economy, such as the fuel you use for your cars. Um, there's a lot of chemical processes that we use electricity or we combust fossil fuels for in order to get up to temperatures we can't get just from electricity. And so, there's a whole lot of uses for nuclear power that, that countries may be interested in, that may be a reason for them to justify their nuclear program um, that are there to worry about when you're thinking about whether or not a country is interested in producing nuclear weapons with their so-called civilian reactors. Um, this is what I got when I searched health on Google Images. But uh, you can also use nuclear technology for producing medical isotopes that are very important for different therapies in the medical field. Um, it's important, though, to keep in mind that what you're essentially doing when you're producing medical isotopes is you're producing a very, very specific nuclear isotope with your nuclear reactor so, or your accelerator. So medical isotope production is something that's uh, very important, but if you have the ability to produce exactly what you want with your nuclear facility, that's definitely something to scrutinize. Um, this one has wind turbines, but uh, as I mentioned before, with small modular reactors, you also may use nuclear reactors for remote locations uh, because they have very few um, environmental conditions that they require as opposed to other power sources. Um, for example, nat even natural gas pipelines can freeze in cold regions and this isn't as much of an issue with the nuclear reactor. So, I mean, part of the reason that nuclear submarines exist is because they can operate extremely quietly and they can stay submerged for a long period of time. The same concept of being able to be clandestine can be extended to nuclear reactors that we're developing to be more and more applicable anywhere in the world. 
Um, and then just the final one that I wanted to talk about, because it's the one I'm most interested in, is uh, ocean water desalination. So turning ocean water into drinkable water or potentially used for things like agriculture. Um, and the reason I said in the desert here is because there are countries um, such as the United Arab Emirates that are ramping up their nuclear or they're building nuclear power plants for civilian use for the first time. Um, and I think it's in Dubai is the largest desalination plant in the world. I mean, they rely on desalinated water for their drinking water. And so we're going to see a lot of Saudi Arabia is pursuing a civilian nuclear power program as well. So these are sort of incentives for countries that have never had nuclear power before as the climate changes and as more areas become water scarce, um, that they'll be pursuing nuclear, nuclear power programs. So it's just something to keep an eye on. Um, and then this was just sort of a little plug because this is what I work on, but uh, there's a lot of advanced nuclear reactor companies in the country. And I just wanted to point out that there's one here in Berkeley as well. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, yeah, I guess I told you about reactors, told you how the nuclear reactor generally works. And I also gave you a little bit of more information about what's going on in the civilian side of things. Any other questions before we turn it over to Dr. Ma? All right. Well, if you have any other questions about the presentation after the fact, feel free to send me an email or anything else.